Yo, what's going on, Blackish fam? I hope everyone has started the new year off well. I wanted to reach out with a different type of reaction this morning. Uh, I'm looking at Malcolm X's legendary speech, The Ballot or the Bullet. And, you know, with, with so much going on in Chicago, it, it, it just seems like we're repeating the past. And it seems like the beginning of a new civil rights movement. And, you know, it, it, it's evident that the things that we worked for and protested about in the past, uh, they just haven't, our actions haven't been strong enough, uh, right? Uh, one would argue that we're in the same position, if not worse, uh, than we might have been 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, so I think of Malcolm X, and uh, I haven't heard this speech, uh, but I, you know, I wanted to go over his work and their approach, which I, I think is something that we, uh, we're, we're revisiting, right? We're at a very similar place. Um, and I just I wanted, uh, this was an intelligent brother uh, that always had a good word, and uh, I wanted to see if we could react to this, do something a bit different. Let's check it out. Mr. Moderator, Reverend Clay, brothers and sisters, and friends, and I see some enemies. <laughs> Let's be real, right? If you're spinning, a, if you have a platform, uh, there will be haters. In fact, I think we'd be fooling ourselves if we had an audience this large and didn't realize that there were some enemies present. I like how Malcolm X keeps it real. You might this have to ready. We want to talk about the ballot or the bullet. The ballot or the bullet explains itself. But before we get into it, since this is the year of the ballot, or the bullet, I would like to clarify some things that refer to me personally concerning my own personal position. I'm still a Muslim. That is, my religion is still Islam. My religion is still Islam. I still credit Mr. Muhammad for what I know and what I am. He's the one who opened my eyes. And At present, I'm the minister of the newly founded uh, Muslim Mosque Incorporated, which has its offices in the Teresa Hotel, right in the heart of Harlem. That's the Black Belt in New York City. And when we realize that Adam Clayton Powell is a Christian minister, he's the, he has the Abyssinia Baptist Church, but at the same time, he's more famous for his political struggling. And Dr. King is a Christian minister in Atlanta, from Atlanta, Georgia, or in Atlanta, Georgia, but he's become more famous for being involved in the civil rights struggle. There's another in New York, Reverend Delamison. I don't know if you've heard of him out here. He's a Christian minister from Brooklyn, but has become famous for his fight against the segregated school system in Brooklyn. Reverend Cleve, right here, is a Christian minister here in Detroit. He's the head of the Freedom Now Party. All of these are Christian ministers. All of these are Christian ministers, but they don't come to us as Christian ministers. They come to us as fighters in some other category. I'm a Muslim minister. The same as they are Christian ministers, I'm a Muslim minister. And I don't believe in fighting today in any one front, but on all fronts. All right, now. And I think this is so important as we go into uh, what's going to be just a brutal election season. Think about the presidential election 2024. Uh, Republicans, is Trump going to come back? Uh, it, can he even do that with everything that happened? Uh, is he going to have some sort of charges uh, brought against him? I, I don't know, but I'm saying it's going to be a crazy election season, and I'm sure there's going to be someone that can contest him, uh, even in the Republican Party. Uh, but then we look at the Democrats, right? And I don't even know who their candidate would be. I'd want to say that Joe Biden's going to be way too old to even think about something like this, but you never know. I've seen crazier stuff. Kamala Harris, I just don't think she's ready. I love her. I kind of wanted her to be 
I wanted her to be it, but man, it seems like she's kind of kind of messing a few things up there. And I, I think she might be tarnishing her name. We'll give her some time. It's still early, but I, I don't know who the Democrat Party would bring. But think about how important this is and what he's saying, the ballot or the bullet, right? Uh, there's a lot of political power in numbers. And what, <coughs> excuse me, I'm a little under the weather. And we got to remember, you know, why do people want to uh, have us going against each other, right? What would happen if, uh, let's say, all of Chicagoland was unified? Uh, how strong would we be, right? And what if we had actual political power in our own city? Uh, what if we took part of the city's budget and directed the, it towards specific neighborhoods? Now, what if the north, west, east, and south sides of Chicago all had similar budgets that we can manage internally uh, to do things like construction in our own hood, right? How many people are in our hood on the west side of Chicago uh, that want to do better, that need jobs, and the jobs simply aren't there, right? And they're very hard to get. Uh, and it, it's, you know, a lot of people that aren't from the inner city of Chicago say, hey, pull your bootstrap, pull, pull yourself up, right? Uh, the problem is there's a lot of uh, institutional issues and systemic issues. Uh, there's a lot of things that, and a lot of this, it, it's not, you know, take a, a, a young brother from the inner city. They don't know that what they're doing is wrong and is going to prevent them from getting jobs. They're trying to live day by day, right? And a lot of times they lack guidance. And, you know, I think that's uh, just a, such a different approach. You know, we spend so much time going off, you know, Black Lives Matter, which, you know, I support 100%. But I think we need more of a blackish university, right? We need to teach, we need to guide, uh, not just others, uh, but we need to help guide ourselves. Uh, and that's like, I don't think we're getting that from any one person or anything that's uh, across the board right now. And that's part of the problem, right? Is we're not stopping uh, what's going on in these ghettos and these bad cities. We just keep pushing people to, to certain areas Kind of reminds me of what the country did to the Indians, right? We keep putting them on land that uh, we don't want and pushing them further and further away from the uh, downtown areas. Uh, and we just let the problem build and build for future generations. Uh, and, yo, we both need to come to a solution because I guarantee you, uh, people in Chicago, we don't want to be just living in the hood. Right. We, we want a better neighborhoods and good schools. and We want to be able to raise our kids uh, and without risking them getting shot walking to school. So I think there's something that we can uh, come to terms with here. In fact, I'm a black nationalist freedom fighter. Right now. Islam is my religion. But I believe my religion is my personal business. And that's so something that we don't have. Right now, there's all types of division in our own communities, right? From gangs to neighborhoods, the west side, the south side, the north side. And just think about that. If we just put religion aside and we put our differences aside and we all work together to, to, to keep to build our local economy, man, Chicago would be straight. It really would, but uh, we can't seem to put aside simple things. Like, listen to what he's saying, right? This is somebody, somebody who's a Muslim, right? He's saying that he's a minister, uh, but he's also saying, like, yo, that that's my personal belief, right? There, we, we might all be Christian or Catholic or Muslim, but before that, and some might argue this, but we're black or we're white, or we're Mexican, or we're Puerto Rican, there's a common bond uh, between a lot of us minorities that if we would just recognize the struggle, that we can unify. Now, think about what he's saying. It doesn't matter what religion you are, but we're all in this fight together. It governs my personal life, my personal morals, and my religious philosophy is personal between me and the God in whom I believe. Right. Just as the religious philosophy of these others is between them and the God in whom they believe. And this is best this way. 
Were we to come out here discussing religion, we'd have too many differences from the outside. Yeah, for and real. we could never get together. It'd be like so today, today, though Islam is my religious philosophy, my political, economic, and social philosophy is black nationalism. You and I... <laughs> As I say, if we bring up religion, we'll have differences, we'll have arguments, we'll never be able to get together. But if we keep our religion at home, keep our religion in the closet. <laughs> right now, we could say say the same thing about uh, gang affiliation, right? I, I kind of envision this like we're speaking to the, the west and south side of Chicago, uh, to these youth that are out here. Uh, you know, blasting each other and uh, bringing it's like, man, the long term uh, 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 implications of what you're doing are going to affect future generations and your kids and your uh, property values. And, you know, for we need the West and South Side to thrive and we all do better. Keep our religion between ourselves and our God. Stuff aside, when we, we come out here, we have a fight that's common to all of us against the enemy who is common to all of us. You know, has, has it ever been thought of for the powers that be to unify to one gang and maybe have a, a council of people that represent all of the different gangs at the table, but we make moves as one and bring down punishment, so like violations as one, but we unify to build a better Chicago? Man, that could be sick, right? That could be something that's like a union, <laughs> you know, where you're all working together, sharing job opportunities, building a community. We're helping to build properties in our, on our own community. Imagine trying to get funding for something like that or creating it as a nonprofit, right? Uh, so that you can get uh, donations, you can get people that see the vision, the bigger picture of a better Chicago, um, and you're basically managing that transformation. There's a lot we could do if we just unify, right? What is it? Who are who are these people behind the scenes that we can't get to come to the table? Or is it up to us? Think about that. The political philosophy of black nationalism only means that the black man should control the politics and the politicians in his own community. Yeah, right and one would argue funding like why is it that there's this there's this massive shortage of jobs right this huge shortage of jobs in the in chicago on the west side and south side of chicago there's a lack of businesses there's a lack of uh, people that are hiring people that were formerly incarcerated right that might have records um and it's just let's let's face it there's not a lot of industry going on anymore right uh, so why is it that we need all this work done. Why can't we control that funding in our own community? Couldn't we have representatives in our community that control maybe uh, even teaching people or getting people that are out of prison or on probation or parole or teaching them uh, how to patch up holes, right? How to remodel buildings. You know, a lot of this knowledge is already in the hood. Couldn't we put more people to work in our own hood by keeping funding that's designated for our hood and using it internally to help rebuild our hood? Like, is there a process for this? Again, who are these people that aren't coming to the table to discuss uh, why what we're doing isn't working and we continue to do the same thing? The time, the time when white people can come in our community and get us to vote for them so that they can be our political leaders and tell us what to do and what not to do is long gone. Oh, no. <laughs> think about that, right? Think about that. The ideas that we're discussing here, right? Keeping money in our hood, creating a system where our teenagers and our youth can uh, go to college for free, get education and have daycare. We can do it in our own hood. Uh, but what, you know, what are we doing? How is our government, how are our aldermen, how is our mayor of Chicago helping our hoods right now? You know, why aren't there programs where we can, yeah, a lot of people want to build 
our own grocery stores, right? Our own laundry mats, our own corner stores, our own liquor stores. Now, where's the funding for that? You know, but if I come here from another country, I can get a ten or fifteen thousand dollar loan to open a Dunkin' Donuts uh, anywhere. But it's really hard if I just come from the hood uh, to get a twenty thousand dollar loan uh, to get me up and started, right? Where is that? And again, where are the people that are supposed to come to the table to discuss this? If if you're if you're really representing the community, then why aren't you speaking on our behalf, right? I think we need someone that's that's a, a would be speaking in representing, uh, I want to say the nation, but I, I want to say the inner city communities, right? Because uh, just as uh, you know, Donald Trump won a few years ago because he represented uh, the people that felt like they didn't have a voice. And what about in places like Chicago? Think about that. How many of us feel like, I mean, who the hell is Lori Lightfoot? What is she doing? I know Chicago's jacked up and there's not just one answer, but what we're doing is not working. And uh, it's it's very clear that we need unification in Chicago. There's too many small areas that are each trying to do good for themselves. And that we're just, if we were to work as a unit, we can still make it competitive between different areas of Chicago. Um, but we, we really need to build on each other before that. By the same token, the time when that same white man, knowing that your eyes are too far open, can send another Negro into the community, get you and me to support him so he can use him to lead us astray those days are long gone. <laughs> How often does it happen, right? In Chicago, I know because we start hearing the ads on WGCI 107.5, right? That's the station for hip hop and R&B in Chicago. And everybody and their mama and the grandmama listens to it. You only have one other option, which is 92.3. And they'll get airtime on that too. And you'll hear the political ads. They stock with like gospel, right? <laughs> And then they're pushing some candidate down our throat. And what happens? There's some name recognition. You check them out. And the person may or may not get elected, right? Um, but it normally, whoever has the best coverage and the best representation of the hood gets elected. We need to start putting people in these positions that can make real change and be the voice of the community. And let's be honest, a lot of people in Chicago aren't even voting, <laughs> We're not voting for judges. We're not voting for the for for like local politics, right? Uh, when Barack Obama was uh, running for president, that's the biggest movement I've seen in my lifetime of people that went out for real change. But why is it when a, a regular everyday a common election comes, especially something local, we're not supporting it? You're letting the people around you make decisions for you, and it's hurting our communities. <laughs> The political philosophy of black nationalism only means that if you and I are going to live in a black community, and that's where we're going to live, because as soon as you move into one of their, as soon as you move out of the black community into their community, it's mixed for a period of time, but they're gone, and you're right there all by yourself. <laughs> no. It's amazing that so much of what he's talking about is happening again. Right? This is still relevant today. And it's, it's actually something you can Google called white flight, right? It's when, uh, like what happened in New York before, um, before the, the 70s. You know, New York was a place that was basically bankrupt. And a lot of the white community left inner city New York, like the Bronx, and they ran to the suburbs. That was a, a situation called white flight. And it does happen, right? We've seen that look in areas of Chicago, you ever wonder why that invisible line on Austin separates a good and a bad community, right, from Oak Park? Uh, there were people that fled certain parts of the area when, uh, because there were too many uh, black or minority families there, you know, and it changes our communities until all of a sudden when they want that property back. Look at what happened in Cabrini Green, right? You got property in Lincoln Park uh, that's valuable. Oh, they were quick to t turn those tear those buildings down and just move people into random gang neighborhoods and bad areas of Chicago. 
and they wonder why Chicago is the shit show it is today. Uh, you got gangs living next door to each other now. Uh, a lot of people don't realize when they're not from the community that there are rules in the community, right? When I grew up, you didn't tag somebody's mama's garage because you get a mouse shot at the park the next day. And if you weren't at the park the next day, they went to the high school or they saw you in the neighborhood and you got a mouse shot for doing something stupid and bringing more heat to our neighborhood. There's rules to this shit. And what a lot of people don't realize is when you're uh, at an outsider looking in, it looks chaotic. But there is some value, and there would be a lot of value with us having additional representation in government uh, because there is a voice that's not being heard right now from our political leaders. We must, we must understand the politics of our community, and we must know what politics is supposed to produce. We must know what part politics play in our lives. And until we become politically mature, we will always be misled, led astray, or deceived or maneuvered into uh, supporting someone politically who doesn't have the good of our community at heart. So the political philosophy of black nationalism only means that we will have to carry on a program, a political program of re-education to open our people's eyes, make us become more politically conscious, politically mature, and then we will, whenever we get ready to cast our ballot, that ballot will be, classed for, uh, will be cast for a man of the community who has the good of the community at heart. Oh. Exactly. That's exactly what we were just saying. There's a to too many times are we just, uh, we have these leaders and we act like there's no control or we simply don't have, uh, a lot of people I talk to are like, yo, you know there's an election? They're like, oh, I don't care about elections, bro. I'm just doing my day to day, bro. I get that, but it's so hard for us to make any progress when there's people like you that become part of the problem, right? It's like, yo, it, it, the, 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 you just stop and listen to what we're saying, right? We need the numbers to make change. By you not taking a stance, you're hurting us. You're impacting us. And I think we have a problem with that today, right? We don't want to ever tell somebody like, yo, yo, yo. You're fucking this shit up, right? There's too many participation trophies going around and just like, no, your kid fucked up and he missed a shot. He'll do better next time because he'll go outside and he'll practice that goddamn shot a hundred times. And next time he comes up, I bet you he hits that shot. The economic philosophy of black nationalism only means that we should own and operate and control the economy of our community. You would never find, you can't open up a black store in a white community. White man won't even patronize you. And he's not wrong. He's, he got sense enough to look out for himself. And you, if you don't have sense enough to look out for yourself. Think about that, right? But think about that. But also, why can't we get the funding within our own community to help build our own communities? I, I don't get that. Why is it that you have to go to a bank, right? Or you have to go to a credit union we need to establish more credit unions and more local banks. And, you know, it sounds sometimes, I heard this quote once that I wish I uh, remembered where, but it said, sometimes to add to your life, you have to subtract from your life. And, and think of all the things that we need to, to do differently in Chicago. And uh, it's like, yo, why can't we employ people of Chicago to make things that are specifically used for the people of Chicago, right? That, what about the contracts for paper towels, uh, toilet paper uh, from all the Chicago park districts? Do you know what they do now? They do a RFP, a request for a proposal, and they send out and they let others bid on that work. Wouldn't it be great that if we handled those own projects in our hood? Think about that. Somebody could be, uh, you know, working with someone to get uh, paper towels in or make Q-tips. Right, and we're supporting the entire community. The larger that community base, right, the more profitable it is. Like, look at what we did to Amazon. And yo, know, let's be real, everybody and their mama uses Amazon right now. And look at the power we gave them. Imagine if that was somebody within the black community or uh, just a fraction of that economic power. We're, we're, we're making bad decisions ourselves. But we need better, we can't say, yo, shop at your local food mart 
and we go to the local food mart and it's just a place where you can buy weed, <laughs> right? And they got they got milk, eggs, Cheetos, and weed. And we need to do better too, but there needs to be funding so we can rebuild these stores. People can get funding to open their own little small shops and then we can go and visit those stores. But right now there's areas of the west side of Chicago uh, that just look broken and like a like a war had passed through and there was no rebuilding of the nation you know and it's like you need to rebuild right we need jobs and there's a lot of people that are there ready to work and capable um that are going to other means of making money uh and it's like yo we can make some real change here uh, by simply getting people off the street putting a hammer in their hands and rebuilding the homes that city of chicago owns quite a bit of property quite a bit a lot of it is on the demo list or foreclosed think about the good that we can do if we were to renovate those homes and sell those on the market and the income that we can be bring back into the organization right and think about the property values all going up on the west and south side of chicago you know the west and south side of chicago has some of the most beautiful homes in the entire chicagoland area you go to Humble Park or Lincoln Park and you see the, the, the those amazing gray stone buildings and such, go, go ahead and take a drive down uh, uh, King Drive or, or, or Lakeshore Drive and look at the south side of Chicago. There could be amazing property values there, right? And, and this could really be a sought after place. Think about the Green Line and all the areas on the west side that would be affected by a revitalization project. The white man, the white man is too intelligent to let someone else come and gain control of the economy of his community. But you won't let anybody come in and control the economy of your community. Control the housing, control the education, control the jobs, control the businesses uh, under the pretext that you want to integrate. No, you're out of your mind. <laughs> And, you know, he might be a little strict on the integration, right? I know that's talk of yesteryear, right? Um, but, you know, it's like, uh, it, it's like the United States uh, tr sending money overseas, right, to help rebuild nations when we have the west and south side of inner cities uh, that look horrible, right? Um, but it's also taking that approach where, you know, we, we need to keep money in our city, in our hoods. We need a little small mom and pop shops that make donuts and sell tools but even more importantly we need to support those businesses i saw something that's really cool young black entrepreneur opened up his own video game store uh, like a gaming store right he had all types of systems and he was all proud in the local paper man the next time i logged on to facebook he had a sad face and he got hit over the weekend and somebody robbed his small business of all the Bro, we need to have some respect in our hoods, man. Yeah, like whoever did that, man, that's, that's grimy, bro. We can't get change unless we're big enough to understand the change and, and what we need to do. We all got a role. We all got to play the role, man. And, and, you know, it's like sometimes you do what you have to do to do what you want to do. And we need a few years to make some really tough decisions uh, to get our city out of the, out of the, the hole it's in. <laughs> The political, the economic philosophy of black nationalism only means that we have to become involved in a program of re-education exactly. to educate our people into the importance of knowing that when you spend your dollar out of the community in which you live, the community uh, in which you spend your money becomes richer and richer, the community out of which you take your money becomes poorer and poorer. Yo, and this goes with now, and I, he didn't have this in his time, but it also goes with... Uh, with websites, right, and company online businesses. Uh, these businesses that you spend your money, you're giving them a say, and you need to know what that say is going to entail. You know, do they, sp do they spend money on lobbying to, to change different laws? Well, what laws? What are their political viewpoints, right? And again, Black Lives Matter, right? I'm, I, I'm a fan, I, anytime, but, you got to understand the name has been tainted. Uh, the name has been tainted with hate, and I think we need a little bit more. 
and uh, yo, I welcome you guys to use Blackish University. You know, we can. Uh, it's definitely something uh, I'm. I'm willing to do work there too, um, and do whatever I can, right? But we need change, and it comes from re-education. Uh, and, and it's like, how do you get that education? How's it being fed? Are you controlling the sources, right? Uh, we talk about re-education, but who's creating these rules? There's just so much of a larger conversation that's needed. And it's like, who's at the table, right? Where Where is this change coming from? And who's responsible to lead the fight right now? These are all questions. If you're an intelligent person sitting in Chicago and you're sitting in a bad neighborhood uh, with a property that lacks value compared to somewhere just a few miles away, uh, look at Malcolm X right there. You need to stop and think, right? What is going on? Is there a system in place that is meant to keep me in place? And, and you know, who are they? Who are the powers that be? And am I, am I supporting them? Right? There's so much that we need to do it as, as a community. And I don't know if it's an intellectual issue. Are there not people having conversations on this level? And if not, why not? And where are the leaders, the trusted inner city leaders that can help uh, direct the dialogue, right? Uh, to make real change. And because these Negroes who have been misled, misguided, are breaking their necks to take their money and spend it with the man. The man is becoming richer and richer and you're becoming poorer and poorer. And then what happens? The community in which you live becomes a slum. It becomes a ghetto. The conditions become run down. And then you have the audacity to, com to complain about poor housing in a run-down community. Why you run it down yourself when you take it out. Exactly. It doesn't get any simpler than that. You to 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 bring. Yeah, we can get some sorts of uh, some sort of funding from the government, and we can get them to vote on certain programs that we can bring in. But the biggest way to bring money into your community is to do things in your community. Uh, that's how schools get better. That's how the housing market gets better. So but when there's people on the corner, when there's violence, when there's an open air drug market and a lot of crime, a lot of shooting, it doesn't do anybody any good. And you just, you know, it's the perpetuation of the, the poverty cycle, right? So something needs to go in there and, and have major change and change the trajectory of where the city is going. Because if we don't have major change, we're just going to have this whole cycle continue, right? And, and it's like, yo, who's who's ready to lead that charge? Who's ready to take control of a city uh, that's run astray, right? We took away all these gang leaders uh, and mid, mid-market mid kind of managers, if you would, if you're more of a corporate mindset, and we pulled them out, right? We're, it's tough on crime. You pulled all the leadership out, and you didn't treat it like we were some third world country, you never replace those leaders, right? Now you got a lot of kids that don't answer to anybody walking around with guns and shooting because you called them an asshole on Twitter. Now think about this, right? Uh, you would never go to a country and remove its leadership without putting a new leadership team in place and, and leading a transition. And we got a lot of work to do in Chicago and yo, unfortunately, you're not gonna do it without the streets. You need the streets to come to an agreement. You can't just say, we're going to do Lori like, uh, life with it. Uh, we're going to go after a, a civil uh, asset forfeiture. You know what that means? That means that they can take your property if, uh, if they suspect you of a crime. You don't have to be charged with a crime. And it's like, yo, you think, you think gangs are that stupid? You think people in organized crime are that stupid where they're making money and putting things under their own name? Everybody in their mama knows you create an LLC and you pay yourself through the LLC as a consultant or however that might be. Uh, and you, you legally obtain things when you're in a posi position to do so. If you're going after assets, like this is some uh, Miami uh, cocaine gang of the 80s, uh, you're going to get a lot of grandmama's uh, Toyota Corolla, <laughs> right? You won't get Big Mama's SUV with the handicap placard. Uh, and you're, you're, it, it's just another way to terrorize our air. If you start giving the police the ability to take assets, 
uh, you you give them the ability to terrorize our neighborhoods when things don't go as planned. And yo, uh, I support law enforcement, but I support the bigger picture of the city too. And you are no longer going to be able to to just go around and just shoot people at will. And there needs to be uh, better training as well with the Chicago police officers. But you know, I don't think they're against that, right? And I I do think that cops normally have good intentions, but there's a lot of people that don't, and we need to get them off the force. So the police union needs to work with the city of Chicago, with the mayor and the leadership team, but we all got to have respect for one another and be working towards a common goal, and that is just not happening in Chicago right now, and our leadership team is... <laughs> And you and I are in a double track because not only do we lose by taking our money someplace else and spending it, when we try and spend it in our own community, we're trapped because we haven't had sense enough to uh, set up stores and control <laughs> the businesses of our community. The man who's controlling the stores in our community is a man who doesn't look like we do. He's a man who doesn't even live in the community. So you and I, even when we try and spend our money in the block where we live or the area where we live, we're spending it with a man who, when the sun goes down, takes that basket full of money exactly. in another part of the town. That's exactly it, right? You get a lot of these uh, Indian guys, right? And nothing against Indian dudes or Pakistani or whatnot, but opening uh, liquor stores, right? Uh, opening little food marts. And man, they are taxing everything. Now, a lot of times they're you know, all right, well, yeah, we'll take EBT, right? They're allowing people to run cigarettes, run other things on EBT. They're a part of the problem. Um, and But it's unfortunate they drive back to Skokie, <laughs> right? And they go to their, their uh, you know, nice $450,000 home and can put their kids in private education. And they're setting their own kids up and building generational wealth and investing in things. And we're still looking stupid sitting there buying liquor, sometimes forming a line uh, just to control, you know, our habits. Like, think about that, right? What, do you ever see a black-owned liquor store? What about a black area, a little small store? You just sold blunt wrappers. Blunt wrappers, and you, that was it, right? Like, we got to be able to support these communities, but we also need to get these people. You want to, like, all this talk about reparations, like, like, I, I get it, right? How do you pick and choose who receives and who doesn't? You get people like me that I was obviously watered down at some generation. Look at Malcolm X. He was as well, right? I still identify as black. Uh, but who's to say that some Mexican or Puerto Rican dude doesn't identify as black because he's mixed with African and something? You know what I mean? Like, how does that work? Well, I think one thing that we can do is we can offer support. We never got our 40 acres in a mule. Now, but you can help us get a grant or a loan to start a business in our, in our own community. And Chicago has some of that. But you look at, uh, you know, these initiatives to, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll help uh, slightly, uh, but you have to already own the property or they put these conditions in place. And it's like, you know, to help your everyday, everyday Joe that's sitting there, you put less conditions in place, right? I get it. There's fraud and there's whatnot. You have to find other ways to manage that. But we need systems in place that would let your everyday uh, intelligent person that wants to start a business be able to op open a business in his own hood. And how much does it really take, right? Couldn't we find a way to help incentivize uh, property owners or property manage or manage properties ourselves? Uh, think about that, right? If we had an incentive, maybe three to six months of uh, free rent, right? Or you're incentivized or it's, it's somehow paid uh, through government funding uh, to start your business, right? Or give you a small amount as a salary. Uh, think about how many more people would start business or stay in business uh, if they had more options, right? Now, I, I was involved in a business and we got up to about 22 employees. Um, we did quite well for ourselves, but we had to navigate a system that was uh, that taught me quite a bit. And I have a, somewhat of a legal background, uh, and I have a, 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 I can break down uh, things better than most. Um, and it was still hard navigating the system at times. 
And it's like, we need, we need to do better. We need to do better. Yeah, we need, we need stores in our hood, but we need a way to get those stores and more people to guarantee to support those stores, right? You can buy TVs at Walmart all day, <coughs> but you're sending your, somewhere, your money somewhere else and you're getting a lot of people rich. Think about that. If we supported the, the guy that does local work or a local gaming store uh, or did computer repair and you didn't use these big corporations that are just the, the same, whatever suburb you go to all across America, it's the same Marshalls, Five Guys, Kohl's, Target, Super Walmart, GameStop, Sport Clips, right? It's like it's the same store. And what restaurant do you go to? Chili's, TGI Fridays, IHOP, Denny's. Uh, it's the same garbage. Panda Express, McDonald's, Burger King, Little Caesars. And it's like we're all living in this bubble and we're all giving our money to all these same players that are at the top of our little bubble. And when someone tries to tell you like, yo, snap out of it, you look at them uh, like you don't know, like a dare looking at a, a headline. Right? We need real change. And to do that, we need to get outside of the bubble. <laughs> right? We need to stop and say, yo, whoa, what the fuck are we doing? Let's all take a step back and just see what happens. Right? There's power in numbers, and we have that number. Ask yourself, uh, who's really the minority? So we're trapped. Trapped. Double trapped. Triple trapped. Anywhere we go, we find that we're trapped. And every kind of solution that someone comes up with is just another trap. <laughs> but the political and economic philosophy of black nationalism, the economic philosophy of black nationalism shows our people the importance of setting up these little stores and developing them and expanding them into larger operations. Woolworth didn't start out big like they are today. They started out with a dime store. And expanded and expanded and then expanded until today they're all over the country and all over the world and they get to some of everybody's money. Yeah. Now this is what you and I and General Motors the same way didn't start out like it is. It's it started out just way. a little rat race type operation. And it expanded and expanded until oh, today it's where it is right now. And you and I have to make a start. And the best place to start is right in the community where we live. And more importantly, we have to support those businesses. Quit asking everyone for a hookup, right? It's hard enough as a, a, a young entrepreneur with all your friends from high school coming out the woodworks asking for a hookup. So our people not only have to be uh, re-educated to the importance of supporting black business, but the black man himself has to be uh, made aware of the importance of going into business. And once you and I go into business, we own and operate at least the businesses in our community. What we will be doing is developing a situation wherein we will actually be able to create employment for the people in the community. And once you can create some, I mean, some employment in the community where you live, it will eliminate the necessity of you and me having to act ignorantly and disgracefully, <laughs> boycotting and picketing some cracker someplace else, trying to dig in for a job. No. It's like, yo, think about that, right? Uh, how, how many times do you hear, yo, we need to, uh, these jobs need to hire more felons, or we need another form of affirmative action. They're not hiring people like me, bro. Man, fuck these people, <laughs> right? We need our own jobs and our own corporations. You're not going to create generational wealth by working for the man. Who told you, you know, people act, we see in post, people post up, man, I did 60 hours this week. Like they're proud. It's like, bro, you are part of a system uh, that you are you're be you're benefiting someone else. And I get it. Not everyone's in a position to make a move like that. But I could show just about any twenty or thirty year old how to make at least five thousand dollars a month at home. Right? I've done it. I built a company around it where we've done over a million in revenue year after year, uh, and it's not hard to do. Uh, how did I do it? I did it with commercial web design. Uh, and, and basic online marketing. And, 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 and what do you do, right? Well, you know, why is it that you'll work for, fight for $15 an hour, right? And try to justify your worth 
when you can be at home making money, too many people are scared or too many people have put too many layers between you and making money. So what did I do? I said, okay, you know what? Uh, selling websites uh, is something that every small business needs and there's always a recurring amount of small businesses. Uh, so I'm gonna do it a little bit different. I'm gonna sell websites at only $1,000 uh, and I'm gonna build those websites. And think about this, nowadays, you can use a what you see is what you get editor. I happen to be knowledgeable on the uh, editing and, and making changes on websites, but it's something that you can learn very quickly yourself. And I reach out to companies and I did this for over a decade and I was able to build a, a very lucrative business. I bought multiple properties, I've had great uh, cars, and I have a residual because I charge for monthly maintenance, hosting and maintenance to those sites. And a thousand dollars, and they pay forty dollars a month. And I've sold thousands of websites across the country. And there's always people that call in, and they need additional websites, or they have additional projects. And think about that: if you do five projects per month, you could call around, you could call people you know, and probably get five projects. Each project pays a thousand dollars, plus it builds a revenue stream. Right? So uh, you think about that. Uh, how much are you making at your job now? Are you making at least $5,000 in a month cash take home? And are you building towards anything in the future? Or are you just working towards your next check? Right? You build a residual stream. And you, the thirty nine ninety five per month, it got to a point where we did our first million dollars in sales. $600,000 of that came from that monthly maintenance. That's not including what we're getting in each month, right? And we were doing, at one point, 50 websites per month. Yeah, <laughs> we just built a, a little infrastructure around it. I was able to build a successful business and exit the industry <clears throat> when I wanted to as well. But what happened? So many people are going, uh, they're intelligent, uh, but they don't know what opportunity is. They think it's too hard to start it. Uh, it's not hard, it's not easy. Uh, it's, it's very easy to start an LLC and to get a tax identification number and start start making moves as an organization. You don't need credit to do it, right? You can be a felon and do it. And there's so many things that are like that that you can do to make money. So we need those jobs in our community. Think about that. If you were doing an operation like that and it's, I was able to hire, and we got up to 22 employees. Think about if you hire five guys from your neighborhood and you taught them how to think like that. You guys are all making above average income. Anyone that we hired was making forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, right out of college, young cats. So think about that. If you can create four or five families, other people are doing other things. Think about landscaping. Think about home maintenance, right? The trades, all the all the work that you bring outside of the community that you could be doing right there. Think about things like web design, SEO, uh, business consulting. Right? I've made $6,000 a month consulting for another company, just on the side, <coughs> excuse me. But these are all things that you can do when you put yourself in, in a position uh, where you're, you're, you're getting knowledge. And nowadays it's not just university knowledge. Think about what we say, Blackish University, right? You should always be building knowledge, investing in yourself. It makes you more marketable. And if you're, you're knowledgeable, there's positions like, yo, I know people right now that are getting five to $10,000 a month and sometimes doing it for multiple companies. And they're living nice, they're affording big homes. I mean, I got a couple homes myself. But there's a lot of people that talk about the struggle, but there's not a lot of people giving you advice on what to do to get out of the struggle. And that's why I think it's so important to revisit things like this where uh, we have a, a brother, you know, when was this, in 1964 or so? I mean, think about how long ago this is still relevant today and we're still not acting. Anytime you have to rely upon your enemy for a job, you're in good shape. Yeah, exactly. When you have, he is your enemy. Anytime, you wouldn't be in this country if some enemy had to kidnap you and brought you there. <laughs> right, does that sound like a friend, bro? Is that someone that has your on the other hand, some of you think you came here on the main <laughs> Think about that, right? You think this country was meant for you? 
Do you think this constitution was meant for you? If you really do research on the, uh, the founders of this great nation, and you'll learn a lot of bad stuff that's not in the U.S. history books. And these are the people that created this country. And there were laws in place not even many decades ago, uh, and there's still some racism and discriminatory practices, and you think you can make moves uh, and, and build in a world like this without real change? You're sadly mistaken, right? We need real change. <laughs> So as you can see, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, t today, this afternoon, it's not our intention to discuss religion. So uh, we, We're going to forget here. religion. If we bring up religion, we'll be in an argument. <laughs> and the best way to uh, keep away from arguments and differences, as I said earlier, put your religion at home, in the closet. Or keep it between you and your God. Because if it hasn't done anything more for you, <laughs> that's not what he's saying, right? He said, you're over here, you know, let's, let's be real. Some of these pastors, unfortunately, I know a few. Uh, some of these pastors are out here bad, right? They're, they're creating these safe havens and these tax shelters that are called churches. And a lot of times you see them pulling up in the Escalade, right? You see them pulling up in the Suburban or the Mercedes, or the 7 Series, right? Everybody else, look at the cars. I guarantee you walk into the parking lot and you know exactly who they are, right? The deacon, the minister, right? Or the pastor, right? You think about that. And, and, you know, you, you see a lot of this. I remember when uh, we had these uh, big floods that were going on in Texas. And a lot of and people are like, yo, what about the mega churches? Right? There's so many people... And they're like, uh, uh, you know, we have some flooding too. We, man, why is it that we got all these, man, you ever come to the western suburbs of Chicago and there's a different church with acres of land? And I go there, I've explored religion. I've really tried to, uh, you know, I've always had these inner demons and, and arguing with faith and these inner battles inside of me, but I've always been one to want to explore religion. Then I go in these big, beautiful buildings and they have all these, cool programs and ping pong tables and free bagels and coffee shops. And it's like, man, why don't you open your doors to the homeless? Why don't you offer programs to teach a trade? Now, uh, why don't you let people clean themselves and use the church? Uh, for wh Why is it that we have these big, beautiful things that we're building and they're just like structures? Uh, and, and think about what change have we got? How, man, how long have you been praying? Uh, and, and change hasn't come. And think about that. You know, hey, you know, is it something? Are you going to keep spinning the wheel? Uh, what did Einstein say when he said, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's the definition of crazy, right? That yeah, doing something the same way over and over and expecting it to change. Um, but we continue to just, man, I'll pray on it. Things will get better. <laughs> Whether you, are, whether you are a Christian or a Muslim or a nationalist, we all have the same problem. They don't hang you because you're a Baptist, they hang you because you're black. They don't attack me because I'm a Muslim, they attack me because I'm black. They attack all of us for the same reason. All of us catch hell from the same enemy. We're all in the same bag in the same boat. We suffer political oppression, economic exploitation, and social degradation. All of us become the same enemy. The government has failed us. You can't deny that. Anytime you live in the 20th century, 1964, and you walk around here singing, we shall overcome, the government has failed. <laughs> yeah, and you gotta love his humor, right? It's like, you know, that we wouldn't even need to be having this conversation, right? It's like, he'd say, you mess around thinking we shall overcome. I get it. We need change. But, man, there comes a time when you're just expecting a system to work that just didn't have your best interests in mind 
for so long, and that, that change comes so slow. <laughs> This is part of what's wrong with you. You do too much singing. <laughs> Today it's time to stop singing and start swinging. Whoa. What is that uh, Toby Duigwe song, right? He said, uh, try Jesus, not me. Because I throw hands, right? <laughs> yeah, yo. You can't sing up on freedom, but you can swing up on some freedom. Cassius Clay can sing, but singing didn't help him to become the heavyweight champion of the world. Swinging helped him. But this government has failed us. The government itself has failed us. And the white liberals who have been posing as our friends have failed us. And once we see it, I, I wouldn't go that far because there's a lot of white liberals uh, that really support our movement. And we've seen that with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and we've seen a lot of people that don't necessarily look like us, but they understand the struggle. They've seen it. And they've unfortunately been a part of it unwillingly sometimes. Uh, but sometimes they benefited from that system. And they still want change. Uh, so I I wouldn't go as far to say that uh, white liberals don't have our best interests at heart. It's just sometimes hard to define what, who and what has our best interests at heart. Because we have uh, priests and church leaders and uh, so-called spiritual leaders. Uh, anytime there's a big shooting, we know exactly who we're going to see leading the march. And we're, we see exactly the law team that we're going to see uh, leading the fight. Uh, and I, I don't know that that's the, the right message, right? Yes, we need leaders in these positions, uh, but not leaders where we have to argue about their intentions. We see that all these other sources to which we turn have failed. We stop turning to them and turn to ourselves. We need a self-help program. A do-it-yourself do philosophy. I do it right now, philosophy. Yo, that's one of the reasons behind this channel, right? Blackest uni uni university, modern day griots, right? What's a griot? A griot is somebody uh, back in the traditions in Africa, specifically West Africa, uh, they passed down information from generation to generation. Now, before there was a written language, uh, they were the storytellers, right? They were musicians. They that gave you the history of your people. They understood a lot of information. So uh, they were somebody that were, uh, but we don't have that right now. In fact, <clears throat> one can create an excellent argument that our information is manipulated and censored, uh, you know, as a way to control us. Uh, so that's why we say modern day griots. This is some of US history and black history that you might not know about, right? Why is this the first time I'm hearing this speech from Malcolm? Max. Well, because we're supposed to do our own research, right? Um, and it's just something where Black Lives Matter, I understand, right? I get the movement. It's been tainted. What we need is a way to think about how we're educating our children and bringing up kids and how we want them to think about the position that we're in. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little under the weather. Uh, it's already too late, philosophy. This is what you and I need to get with. And the only time, the only way we're going to uh, solve our problem is with a self-help program. Before we can get a self-help program started, we have to have a self-help philosophy. Black nationalism is a self-help philosophy. What's so good about it, you can stay right in the church where you are and still take black nationalism as your philosophy. You can stay in any kind of civic organization that you belong to and still take black nationalism as your philosophy. You can be an atheist and still take black nationalism as your philosophy. This is a philosophy that eliminates the necessity for division and argument. Because if you're black, you should be thinking black. 
And if you're black and you're not thinking black at this late date, well, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> Yo, when you think about that, right? It's like we, we need to understand that there's a problem in the world. And we need to first decide what that problem is before we decide how to attack that problem and, and, and get real change, right? How are we going to get social change without the right programs, without the right people in positions of change? And I, I've experienced this at the local level, uh, at a university level, uh, right? With leader, leadership within the university, or you look at uh, people becoming a student trustee and going through the right steps to voice your opinion. And it's like, this isn't happening in Chicago right now. This isn't happening in the country right now the way that it should be. Um, and, and that's just something that, that's really missing. But we need to first understand that we're all in this together and we need real change. And if we want it now, there's power in numbers and uh, you get enough people listening and get that ball rolling. Um, why do you think they put out and eliminated people like Malcolm X in our future? Think about that, right? What incentive uh, or how would this have affect their, affected their position in the world? if some of Malcolm X's uh, theories or uh, thoughts were really put in place. And again, I apologize, I'm a little under the weather. Once you change your philosophy, you change your thought pattern. Once you change your thought pattern, you change your, your attitude. Once you change your attitude, it changes your behavior pattern. And then you go on into some action. As long as you got a sit-down philosophy, you'll have a sit-down thought pattern. And as long as you think that old sit-down thought, you'll be uh, in some kind of sit-down action. They'll have you sitting in every way. It's not so good to refer to what you're going to do as a sit-in. That right there castrates you. Right there it brings you down. What, what goes with it? What so funny how so much of this is still relevant today, right? When we see uh, people protesting and going on uh, chaining themselves or going hand to hand on expressways and it's like bro I get it I'm part of the fight too but I got to get to work or I'm gonna get fired bro I got to get past the line and it's like yo if you want real change there's ways to go bro you know some of these people are marching and protesting then you have a conversation with them and it's like man have you talked about it you know this person is running for office or have you uh, man, I'll get down with politics and it's like, but bro, what are you doing here, right? A lot of people are in it for the wrong reasons. And a lot of people aren't thinking the right way. And there's just somebody needs to call that out too. Think of the image of a someone sitting. An old woman can sit. An old man can sit. A chump can sit. A coward can sit. Anything can sit. Well, you and I have been sitting long enough and it's time today for us to start doing some standing. And some things back there. When we look at, at other parts of this earth upon which we live, we find that black, brown, red, and yellow people in Africa and Asia are getting their independence. They're not getting it by singing, we shall overcome. No, they're getting it through nationalism. It is nationalism that brought about the independence of the people in Asia. Every nation in Asia gained its independence through the philosophy of nationalism. Every nation on the African continent that has gotten its independence brought it about through the philosophy of nationalism. And it will take black nationalism that to bring about the freedom of 22 million Afro-Americans here in this country where we have suffered colonialism for the past 400 years. Oh. <laughs> the man's preaching right there. America is just as much a colonial power as England ever was. America is just as much a colonial power as France ever was. In fact, America is more so a colonial power than they, because she's a hypocritical colonial power behind it. Trust the devil you know. Isn't that what they say? The grass sometimes looks greener, looks greener on the other side, but trust the devil you know is normally advice you give to a girl when she's exiting a relationship because the guy's a bit of an asshole. And then their mama says, trust the devil you know, because the next dude she's with, he looks better and he's not an asshole, but he beats her ass and he puts on a good face for everybody else, right? Think about that. Uh, now, who's in a worse situation? 
uh, is it the guy that was just treating you mean to your face or the guy that's whooping your ass and has a smile on his face? And it, it kind of seems like the comparison that he's given us, like, uh, you know, think about that, right? Uh, just think about that when you think of uh, the United States. <laughs> What is 20, what, what do you call second class citizenship? Why, that's colonization. Second class citizenship is nothing but 20th century slavery. How are you going to tell me you're a second class citizen? They don't. Hey, not just that, but nowadays they also call them prisoners or felons, right? It's a way to segment our communities and make us hopeless, <laughs> to be honest. They have second class citizenship in any other government on this earth. They just have slaves and people who are free. Well, this country is a hypocrite. They try and make you think they set you free by calling you a second class citizen. No, you are nothing but a 20th century slave. Plus, there's a talk of nationalism to move, to remove colonialism from Asia and Africa. It'll take black nationalism today to remove colonialism from the backs and the minds of the 22 million Afro-Americans here in this country. And I don't even know and what the number is. 1964 looks like it might be the year of the ballot or the bullet. You know, think about that, right? Uh, 2024 is the year that uh, we elect a new president uh, for our entire country. Right? How much of this is still relevant? And are we thinking about this when we go to, 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 to cast our vote, right? Can we unify and all support a, a common cause and, and go for real change? We'll see, City of Chicago.